Representative Jamie Raskin, a star in the Democratic Party, had a contentious year in 2022. As a key member on the January 6th committee, Raskin examined former President Trump's role in the attack on the Capitol. The Maryland Democrat took a number of shots at Republicans this year. In the wake of a controversy stemming from comments made by Representative Madison Cawthorn, Raskin responded by saying, quote, our party is not for cocaine-fueled orgies. Raskin also caused a number of controversies of his own over his comments that some Republicans took offense to and asked to be stricken from the record. Raskin easily won re-election, but will find himself in the minority after Republicans took control of the House. Mr. Speaker, the Rules Committee met yesterday and reported a rule, House Resolution 1065, providing for consideration of S-3522, the Ukraine Democracy Defense Lend-Lease Act, under a closed rule. The rule provides for one hour of debate equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Foreign Affairs. The rule provides for one motion to commit. The rule extends recess instructions, suspension authority, and same-day authority through May 13. Finally, the rule deems HRES 1035 as passed. Mr. Speaker, Vladimir Putin's criminal war of aggression and atrocity against the sovereign nation of Ukraine has dismembered the second largest country in Europe. Putin's soldiers have killed more than 2,700 Ukrainian civilians and more than 100 children in Ukraine. They have raped and murdered untold numbers of women, leaving their bodies in the street. They have wounded thousands of civilians and they have displaced 10 million Ukrainians, creating the largest exodus of displaced persons since the Nazis rampaged through Europe. And they have traumatized a nation. It is a sobering thing to canvas the damage on today, which is Holocaust Remembrance Day. Putin's invasion is intended to deal a fatal blow to democracy in Ukraine and around the world. But Putin's lurch into fascist aggression has actually unified and galvanized the democratic world, the democratic nations and peoples and movements of the world. I concede that Putin still has his cheerleaders for his homophobia, his corruption, and his white nationalist racism around the world. I can see that some people, even in this body, continue to chant the filthy words Russia hoax to describe what we know from our own intelligence community of Putin's unceasing efforts to subvert democracy all over the world. And I concede that Vladimir Putin has been called a genius by a former twice impeached president for his assault on a sovereign democratic nation. But the vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of democratic societies around the world reject Putin's atrocities against democracy. And President Zelensky and President Biden have rallied the world against Putin and in defense of the heroic people of Ukraine standing strong against this aggression. People who have more courage in their pinky than Vladimir Putin and his thugs will ever be able to understand. Mr. Speaker, NATO members have sent or promised at least $8 billion in weapons to Ukraine. The billions we have sent from the United States of America has made a key difference in allowing the people of Ukraine to defend themselves. The people of America have paid for anti-tank and anti-air systems, for helicopters, for drones, for grenade launchers, for 50 million rounds of ammunition and more. Today, the Ukraine Democracy Defense Lend-Lease Act of 2022 comes before Congress as an important part of the effort to defend Ukraine. This act is rooted in the Lend-Lease Program of World War II, which President Roosevelt proposed in January of 1941 and which allowed our government to lend or to lease war supplies and equipment to any nation whose security was defined as vital to the defense and the security of the United States. 
Passage of that act enabled Great Britain and Winston Churchill to keep fighting and to survive the fascist Nazi bombardment until the United States could enter the war. President Zelensky has said that Ukraine needs weapons to sustain themselves, and President Biden has answered that call with billions in military assistance since Russia's full-blown invasion began on February 24th, a day that will live in infamy in the freedom-loving world. On April 21, last Thursday, President Biden announced that we will be sending an additional $800 million in military aid to Ukraine, the eighth such installment, which will include 72 howitzers, 144,000 artillery rounds, 72 tactical vehicles, and more than 120 Phoenix Ghost tactical drones. And today, I understand President Biden has asked for uh, an additional aid package for the next several months. But S-3522 will streamline current legal authorities under the Ex Arms Export Control Act that allows our government to lend defense articles needed to defend civilian populations. So we will eliminate red tape to make it easier for our government to lend or lease necessary military equipment in this struggle to defend Ukraine. The legislation requires the Biden administration to establish expedited procedures for delivering military equipment to Ukraine and other affected Eastern European countries to defend populations made vulnerable by Vladimir Putin's aggression. It also facilitates the provisioning of loaned and or leased defense articles to Ukraine, easing a myriad of administrative regulations and processes. Mr. Speaker, I urge everyone to support this legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman from Maryland reserves. The gentleman from Pennsylvania is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, Abe Lincoln <clears throat> once wrote a beautiful passage um, in which he compared the Constitution and the Declaration. He said, the Constitution is like a silver picture framing the apple of gold. And the apple of gold, he said, is liberty, liberty for each and every person in the country. And the silver frame exists to protect the apple, he said. The Constitution exists to protect freedom. The apple does not exist to protect the frame. Well, today, both democracy and freedom are under siege in our country. There are right-wing extremists and fanatics who want to destroy both the silver frame of our constitutional democracy, and they came here to show us that they mean business on January the 6th of last year, and also the golden apple of personal freedom to make our own decisions about the most intimate and personal decisions that we could make. They have brought mob violence to the Congress of the United States, threatening to hang the vice president in order to overthrow a democratic election. And now they are about to do violence to the Constitution and the doctrine of a right to privacy, a freedom that tens of millions of Americans and women have considered central to their ability to lead their lives and to conduct their business as citizens of the country. Well, this is an illuminating hearing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Republicans' own witness, the witness they called, is candidly and openly calling for a nationwide ban on all abortions with no exceptions for rape or incest. And if I've got that wrong, I would invite Ms. Foster to correct me. Do I have it wrong, yes or no? Um, if we added rape and incest exceptions, would you vote for it? Uh, okay, I reclaim my time, of course. Uh, the, this is a position for government-compelled childbirth in all cases so extreme that it excludes the vast majority of Americans of all political persuasions. Talk, for example, to our Republican colleague Nancy Mace, who has written movingly of her own rape at age 16, and she refused to stand down before anti-choice extremists in South Carolina who wanted to criminalize abortion, as this witness does in every single case.
in all the cases. The mega party wants to turn what is today and what has been for 50 years a constitutional right into a federal crime. And they want to do it before the 4th of July. I want America to reflect on what's going on here. My wife Sarah and I have been parents for 30 years. There's nothing I'm prouder of than raising three human beings of great decency and character. And I've only been in public office for 15 years, half of that time, but I venture to say I've come to know politicians pretty well. And I hope it offends none of my colleagues here, but I must say, I trust my 29-year-old and 25-year-old daughters infinitely more to make the personal life planning decisions about when, where, and how to start their families and all of the related attendant personal health care decisions about their bodies and their lives than I would ever trust the class of politicians to make those decisions for them. And that's what this is about. And I've served with great public officials from both parties, people like John Lewis, people like Liz Cheney, people like Nancy Pelosi, but I would not trust even the best politicians to make those judgments for my daughters. <clears throat> Much less would I trust the politicians who are fighting to criminalize abortion in all cases, with no exceptions even for violent rape or incest across all of America. Why would we put this decision in the hands of those people? You know, Abraham Lincoln was right about something else. He said, government cannot endure permanently half-slave. <clears throat> he said, government cannot endure permanently half-slave and half-free. And ultimately, I am sure that Abe Lincoln is as right about the 21st century as he was about the 19th century. We are not going to be able to endure half-free and half-controlled by the government. I tremble for my country when I contemplate what this five justice majority is about to do to our country. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, yield back. I yield to my colleague from Maryland. Thank you so much, Ms. McBath, and also for uh, those uh, clarifying remarks. Uh, I, I just, I needed to intervene because I heard the gentleman from Texas uh, talk about how the Department of Justice is somehow being converted into a ministry, ministry of truth. Um, of course, that has nothing to do with the bill, which is all about responding to actual episodes of domestic violence committed by domestic terrorists. Um, but the gentleman opposes a ministry of truth. He seems to support a ministry of lies. Uh, he has bought into I would ask Donald that Trump's the gentleman's lies. words be taken down. I do not support lies. I made that clear. Okay. I would well, ask the middle gentleman's that. words be taken down. Floor, Chairman, I'm not going to sit here and be told gentleman that I will, favor the lies. The gentleman will suspend. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe that the gentleman has endorsed Donald Trump's false claim that he won the 2020 president. I election. have not done so. I have said there was fraud in the election, and that is being brought, borne out. By it has been rejected by more than 60. One at a time. It doesn't change my motion to have the gentleman's words taken down. I won't sit here and be told that does I the gentleman, does the gentleman from Maryland rephrase? That violates the rules. Does the gentleman from Maryland wish to rephrase? Let's see. I, I said that the gentleman from Texas is talking about a ministry of truth. He seems to favor a ministry of lies. I was proceeding to talk about his support for Donald Trump's big lie for uh, Donald Trump's I take it then. That, I take it then the gentleman does not choose to rephrase. <laughs> well, I mean, if, if he's willing to dissociate himself from Donald Trump's big lie, then I'm delighted to take it down. If he will denounce Donald I, Trump's I, big I, lie... I, I take it. The gentleman... The gentleman... The gentleman, the gentleman, uh, if the if the gentleman will withdraw his comments, we can move on. If not, we'll have to vote on taking okay. the words. I, well, it, well it, based on my understanding that he does not advance Donald Trump's big lie, then I'm happy to say that he is not favoring a ministry of lies. 
based on that stipulation, because I, I'd understood that he was going along with uh, Donald Trump's big lie, but if he's not, that's terrific, and I, I just hope Donald Trump the doesn't gentleman, find out. The gentleman, the gentleman the said gen that I support a ministry of lies. That's a lie, gentleman. and I demand gentleman, his words be taken down. Is All right, well, if, look, if you're willing to dissociate yourself from Donald Trump, then I'm happy to withdraw that, but let me just say this. He said that there were people from January 6th uh, who were being uh, somehow, I don't know, falsely or wrongly prosecuted. I wonder if the gentleman... The gentleman, does not with, the gentleman does not withdraw his remarks. Uh, we will have to vote on whether to take down the, gen the gentleman's remarks. Mr. Chair, can I make a parliamentary inquiry? Some of the controversy seems to be over Mr. Gomer's statement that there was a lie in the resolution. If he would tell us what the lie he says uh, was, we could determine whether or not Mr. Raskin's statement is correct or not. It never... does not change the fact that he said I was supporting a ministry of lies, and that's not true. I, he also wanted to point it out, he misrepresented what I said. I did not say that the DOJ was... Uh, I wanted, or it was a ministry of truth. No, would, the DOJ would, is the <laughs> the equivalent of Mr. Goldman. What, what was what lies. was the lie you were referring to? Would Mr. You're Raskin, changing the subject from my Raskin, demand. The words be the taken down. Will suspend. Will Mr. Raskin agree that uh, Mr. Uh, Gomert was not personally lying? Oh, I never said he was personally lying. I, but, but what the, I, what I'm the gentleman, the gentleman agrees he's personally lying. The word is personally not lying. <laughs> the, the words, therefore, uh, I, cannot well, be. All I said the is words, I never said that he was lying. The gentleman will suspend the words. The gentleman has said that he did not ask that he did not call the gentleman from Texas a liar. That he was not personally lying. Therefore. Uh, there is no uh, 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 there is no occasion to take take down anybody's words, and uh, who had the time? Uh, I forget. Mr. Raskin had the time. And Mr. Raskin uh, will continue his remarks. He has a that was okay. minute and a half left. I, I appreciate that. Um, there was some suggestion that there was some uh, false uh, prosecutions going on by the Department of Justice, or people are being hounded. I know some of our colleagues have described people arrested for violent assaults on federal officers and violent invasion of the Capitol and interruption of federal proceeding as political prisoners. Um, and we have uh, people who are somehow claiming to be on the side of the police who have nothing to say about violent assaults on our officers who were injured, wounded, hospitalized, broken necks, broken vertebrae, broken jaws, traumatic brain injuries, post-traumatic stress syndrome. We hear nothing about it. Uh, it's remarkable. So look, either you're going to oppose domestic terrorism across the board or you're not. And I oppose it across the board. If you look at the language of this legislation, it puts us squarely against domestic terrorism across the board. But there's some people who seem to want to be forgiving and indulgent of domestic terrorism if it comes from people who they view as being on their side against critical race theory. And that is a very dangerous moment for American democracy when the two major political parties are not standing together against violent domestic terrorism against our institutions. So I think that's just a sorrowful and tragic moment. And uh, none of us should be supporting a ministry of lies or a ministry of truth in the Orwellian sense. We should just be the supporting the facts and the, the law. Gentleman's, the that. gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman yells back, gentleman from Pennsylvania Reserves, gentleman uh, from Maryland is recognized. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, the very distinguished gentleman from Kentucky purported to speak for what Americans are worried about, and undoubtedly, Many Americans are worried about inflation, which is why this administration has been taking strong action, not just to get jobs for everybody who wants a job and good jobs and union jobs for people, but also to bring inflation down. I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent and certain to the record. A New York Times article entitled, U.S. Gas Prices Have Fallen for 91 Straight Days, a Relief for Consumers. <clears throat> but I want to talk about some of the other things that Americans are worried about. 
uh, since uh, my colleague purported to speak for Americans because I saw a poll recently saying that Americans are worried about the attack on democracy and voting rights. And part of that may be the fact that some of our colleagues seem to be ambivalent about whether or not to denounce the rampant violence that was unleashed against this institution, this body, on January 6, 2021, when thousands of uh, rioters came and attacked our officers, wounding, injuring more than 150 of them, breaking their jaws, their necks, lost fingers, strokes, heart attacks, concussions, contusions. And of course, the former president says that his mob actually greeted the police with hugs and kisses. And so some of our colleagues shamefully have followed the former president in trying to whitewash the worst episode of domestic mass insurrectionary violence ever unleashed on the capital of the United States with an attack on the vice president, Mike Pence. And we heard those words, hang Mike Pence, hang Mike Pence, bouncing off of the walls of the Capitol and against the Congress of the United States. So yes, People are worried about the state of our democracy with so many members of the GOP following Donald Trump in not only his terrible big lie, the first time we've ever seen that in American history, but also the big lie encompassing this mob violence and this insurrection against the government of the United States. You know what else Americans are worried about? Americans are worried about now state politicians and federal politicians trampling the rights of women. For more than a half century, women have had a right to make their most intimate, procreative, and reproductive decisions with their families, with their husbands, with their partners, with their ministers, with their church leaders. And then they gerrymandered the Supreme Court. They kept Merrick Garland off the Supreme Court by not even giving him a hearing over on the Senate side. And then what do you know? They follow what the RNC was asking for in all their platforms for all of those years, overturn Roe versus Wade. And they overturn Roe versus Wade. And then we hear from our colleagues, well, we just want the states to decide. But yesterday, Senator Lindsey Graham unveiled what the real plan is, a nationwide criminal ban on abortion. And if they can go further in the states, they will go further in the states. And we got Republican proposals all over America to completely ban abortion from the moment of conception, which is the pro-life orthodoxy, which is life begins at conception. We heard it in the Judiciary Committee. We've heard it in the Oversight Committee. We've been hearing it for years, but now they have fallen strangely and demurely silent. And why is that? Well, part of it is because of the good people of Kansas who showed them just where America is on this. America is a country committed to individual freedom and the rights of the people to make their own decisions and not having busybody theocrat politicians in state capitals telling them how to make their own decisions about their careers, about their lives, about their families, and about their health care. And certainly not allowing Lindsey Graham to dictate to the women of America what their destiny will be. And they won't say a word about it. They'll talk about an SEC regulation nobody heard of that we're not here to talk about today. They'll, they'll blame Joe Biden for global inflation. They'll, Blame Joe Biden for Vladimir Putin's filthy imperialist invasion of Russia. I hear them denouncing Joe Biden. They won't denounce Vladimir Putin for one second. I'd happily yield a minute if they would denounce Vladimir Putin, but they won't do it. And we've heard people over on their side cheerleading for Vladimir Putin. I heard the general lady from Georgia say, Russia wins. Guess what? Russia doesn't win. The people of Ukraine are winning today. And the people of America are with the people of Ukraine. And we're on the side of Democrats, small d Democrats all over the world, against the autocrats like Putin, against the theocrats, like people who would dictate to the women of America their own health decisions. We're against the tyrants and the bullies and the despots. We're against presidents who get into office and try to dictate the political decision making of individual members of the workforce and try to push their ideological program into the government. And we're for defending whistleblowers, we're for defending the census, we're defending democratic institutions in America. And I'm just shocked that I hear from my good friend from Pennsylvania, someone I like, someone I trust, that he actually is defending Putin against Biden and blaming Joe Biden for Putin's 
long-running plan to invade Ukraine. I mean, that's a remarkable thing to me, and I hope we can have that clarified. I'll reserve. Gentleman from Maryland, research. Gentleman from Maryland. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Uh, and I yield myself as much time as I may consume. Gentleman's recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very proud today to stand for this legislation with the party of democracy and freedom for the people rather than the party of Big Brother and failed drug authoritarianism. Do you know that 150 million Americans have used marijuana? Half of the country, and that's just the people who are being honest about it, half of the country has used marijuana, but you can still be denied security clearance and government employment for having once used marijuana. That is plainly stupid and wrong and unfair. And we are disqualifying tens of millions of qualified and excellent job applicants for federal government employment, our fellow citizens, our constituents in Democratic districts and Republican districts, we are disqualifying those people from being um, federal government employees solely because they've used marijuana. Um, my amendment is one that every member of the House should support. It says that Americans should not be denied a security clearance simply because they have used marijuana. You know, the longer I spend time in Congress, Mr. Speaker, the more I realize that in America, change comes from the states. It comes from the people. That's how, how we got child labor laws. That's how we got women's suffrage. That's how we got direct election of U.S. senators. And now so too with our draconian, obsolete, and failed marijuana laws. Look what's happening out in America. 18 states plus Washington, D.C. have now passed laws allowing adult use of marijuana. In other words, they've accepted the anti-prohibition principle that's in our Constitution. It's not that alcohol is so great for everybody in every circumstance or marijuana is so great for everybody in every circumstance. It's that criminal prohibition and criminalization of large parts of our own population doesn't work. So it's legal in 18 states. In 27 states, it's been decriminalized. In a majority of the states, it's no longer criminal. And in 36 states, the vast majority of America, more than two-thirds of the states, uh, medical use of marijuana has been approved. In other words, it is legal in the vast majority of states of the country to use marijuana for medicinal purposes. What a massive outbreak of common sense in America against the GOP's failed authoritarian war on marijuana that depends on paranoid tropes from the 1970s. It's like they saw reefer madness in middle school and never got over it. I concede our party is not for the kind of cocaine-fueled orgies that a freshman Republican representative bragged about this week, but we do understand that their marijuana prohibition laws don't work for our people. But in any event, Mr. Speaker, we can all agree that we should not be denying our constituents the opportunity to serve in federal office by denying them security clearance simply because they've used marijuana. I reserve. The gentleman from Pennsylvania reserves. Reserve. And the gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. More than 800 Americans have come to testify before our committee. The minority leader should be notified before he leaves the, the chamber. Um, four, four of them have categorically refused and blown off the subpoenas of the U.S. House of Representatives. The minority leader attacks our committee as partisan and political as some of his colleagues do. Well, we're a bipartisan committee with a Democratic chair and a Republican vice chair, but today the minority leader gave the game away as he boiled over with rage towards our committee. He gave the game away. He's very upset that the former chair of the House Republican Conference has been telling the truth about Donald Trump's big lie, his incitement of violent insurrection, and the attack on American constitutional democracy. And that's why he is in the very embarrassing position of having 
supported, offered, and pressed for an independent 9-11 style commission about the January 6th attack. And as the minority leader, he asked for five Republicans and five Democrats. He asked for equal subpoena power on both sides, equal staff on both sides. And Chairman Thompson, who now chairs the January 6th Select Committee and chairs the Homeland Security Committee, he agreed to it. A lot of Democrats were upset about that. They said, we're in the majority. Why should we agree to have everything 50-50 right down the middle? But he agreed. And the Democrats agreed because that's what the Republicans offered. Great. We were going to have a 9-11 style independent commission. And then you know what happened? You know who vetoed it? The fourth branch of government, Donald Trump, who some of their members slavishly report to, like sycophants. And Donald Trump said he didn't want any investigation into the attack on this body, the Congress of the United States. He didn't want any investigation at all. And you know what the minority leader did? He walked it back. They pulled the plug on the independent commission. And that's why we ended up with the January 6th Select Committee in the House of Representatives, which the Speaker has made sure is bipartisan and has operated in my experience, Mr. Speaker, as the most bipartisan committee I've ever been on. Why? Because we don't spend an hour at the beginning of each meeting with a bunch of empty partisan gimmicks and stunts, the kind we just saw wasting the taxpayers' money and time. 20 minutes of that nonsense going nowhere. At the same time there's a, that there's an actual hearing taking place in Canon 310 right now by the Committee on Homeland Security on the question of the border. But instead of attending the hearing, I counted at least five or six different members who were in that conga line. I'll be interested to know whether they're even gonna to go to the hearing afterwards. Instead, they come and participate in that empty, absurd ritual, wasting the time of this body. But the minority leader comes here and amazingly attacks our committee when he sabotaged his own idea. But this committee is closing in on the truth, and that's why we get all these circus antics and all the attempts to distract the American people. My friend from Pennsylvania, if I'd been dealt the hand that you've been dealt today, as a lawyer, as a member of Congress, I suppose I would have done everything in my power to distract the House of Representatives also from the business at hand. We have two people who are flagrantly, brazenly, defying the authority of the House of Representatives of the United States in order to avoid coming here to tell the truth. They are acting in contempt of Congress, and we must hold them in contempt of Congress because of that. I reserve. Thank you. Um, in regards to red flag laws, they're, they just won't stop someone when they want to murder someone. And, and that's just the reality and, and the great concern but what they will do is they'll violate people's due process rights. And I think that we all need to recognize the, the giant political divide in our country. I think we need to recognize that uh, over, over the past several years, Americans are looking at one another and they, they simply may not like someone's political views. They may not like their Trump flag in their yard. They, they may not like someone else's statements. And this, this brings this big slippery slope for false accusations to where they could, uh, you know, claim that someone is a, at a risk of killing others with their guns simply because they, they hold such political views or may have voted for a candidate for office. And I think this is putting Americans in danger, uh, especially, you know, gun owners of losing their gun rights because someone is trying to take their guns away simply because they don't like them and may think a gun owner is, is dangerous when a gun owner is not dangerous. Taking away Americans' gun rights is dangerous. And I'd also like to, to discuss the fact that I think we're looking at, looking at this through the wrong lens. We, we all share something that's so important, and I, I'm really happy to hear you say the things you say. None of us want to see children killed in school. None of us want to see any, any group of people um, attacked in, in a way where they're, they're, they are at risk of losing their life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. That's why I think abortion is wrong. 
takes away Americans' ability to ever have life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. But I think we also need to recognize that the gun being on trial is, is the wrong direction to go. We have, a, we have a broken spirit problem in America. We have a broken human problem in, problem in America. And there's nothing that we're legislating here. There's nothing in this bill, and none, like everyone said, we didn't have anything to do with it. The Senate did, and they did it behind closed doors, and the, and the process is all wrong. And thank you, thank you, Mr. Cole, for recognizing that. But this, this isn't solving anything, and, and I wish it was. Um, actually, it's, it's causing Americans to distrust Congress even more than they already distrust us. They don't, they don't trust Congress because Congress just steadily violates uh, people's rights. And I think that's a shame. So I really ask that you consider my amendment. It's very, very simple. Uh, just, it just states that insert at the appropriate place in the bill in the following, nothing in this act or an amendment made by this act may be construed to deny or infringe upon the due process rights of a person subject to the provisions of this act. It's so simple. And it's so simple that I think that, that we can all come together on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Raskin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, but one of the things that we heard from uh, the gentlelady from Georgia was that um, the proper response to children being massacred in school would be more armed guards, and that the way to protect people is to have more armed guards. And um, several things came to mind. One was that in Buffalo, the shooter Peyton Gendron, I think his name was, was confronted by an armed guard who shot him, but he was wearing body armor, <clears throat> um, and then was able to kill the guard and go on to massacre people uh, in the grocery store. Uh, Ms. Green, do you think the Second Amendment protects body armor too, by the way? Well, Mr. Raskin, here's what I do believe, is I wish that people inside that grocery store had been armed, but the strict gun control uh, where they live, uh, okay. took that ability away from them. I'll reclaim my time. So, Mr. Scott, y your state has seen some terrible massacres, like at Virginia Tech. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we've seen, we saw the massacre at Uvalde, where there were lots of police officers around with guns, but they weren't able to stop uh, the madman who got inside with an AR-15, the 18-year-old who got inside. Uh, with an AR-15 and assassinated those children such that their parents um, had to offer DNA to make a positive identification. Couldn't even identify them visually. Um, what, what do you think about this argument that, well, what we need to do, what I understand her to be saying, is that basically everybody should be armed. Is that going to make us safer if we become the only country in the world where our solution to the problem of massacres in public places is to arm everybody. The, um, the evidence I've seen is if you have armed guards in schools, uh, you have no reduction in, um, in killings. Uh, you do have um, an increase in school to prison pipeline uh, because the police officers there tend to uh, police the children, not protect the children. And so that makes the uh, situation actually worse. I've seen no evidence that um, school resource officers improve anything as police officers. If you have an additional counselor in the school, um, psychologist, things like that, uh, that has been shown to reduce the incidence of, um, of, of, of violence in the school. And so to the extent that the school resource officers providing the counseling and the psychological services, and that's a good thing, but unfortunately they tend to do more of the, of the policing and not more of the counseling. But in terms of a protective, um, most of the school shootings have occurred at schools that that this amendment will be rejected on procedural grounds, but it shouldn't be because it is highly responsive to a good point made by Mr. Raskin. Mr. Raskin made the point that whatever your view of January 6th, the idea of localizing the entire thing on Ray Epps would seemingly be unfair. And what we saw in the Michigan case is that you would you, you saw a dozen 
federal assets and agents involved in just one small matter. And so I think that the amendment is well-founded to ensure that we are responsive to the Raskin concern that is a legitimate one. And, you know, one thing you kind of notice is that, you know, feds are like cockroaches. You see one outside the walls, there's probably 10 behind the walls that you don't see. And in this particular case, we deserve the truth. The answers about what the federal government's involvement was, as Mr. Massey has correctly chronicled throughout this debate, when the Department of Justice has been given the opportunity to say that nobody associated with the federal government, prompted by the federal government, encouraged by the federal government, working for the federal government, increased the criminal acuity of January 6th, they have demurred in doing so. All they would have to say is, nobody associated with the federal government increased the criminal acuity of that day. And I think that a lot more Americans would have comfort that at least on that day in that moment, assets of their own government weren't weaponized against them. But what we do know is that there were a lot of people who may have committed some technical violation of federal law because they crossed over a barricade that they didn't know it had been erected, you know, half an hour, 40 minutes earlier, and then saw their lives destroyed and ruined. And it's just, it's quite something to hear like the crocodile tears from Mr. Epps on the left when he is the only person that we have direct video evidence was encouraging folks to go inside the Capitol. That's what we need answers on. And the time of the gentleman has expired. Does the gentleman insist on his point of order? Yeah, yes, I do. Um, first of all, on the point of order, uh, both the gentleman from Florida and the gentleman from Kentucky just explained what's wrong with this amendment because they said they, they've, just, they've uh, had a change of heart. They want to extend it from Ray Epps to all the agents and assets of the federal government, presumably yeah. all of the right-wing Republican congressmen who were encouraging protesters to enter the Capitol building that night too. But in Wait, any event, that sweeps way beyond the original resolution. So if you want to do that, you're going to have to put in another resolution because we were just assured for the last several hours that all this concerned was one guy, Ray Epps, and what he did. And now suddenly you want to rewrite the entire resolution. So I, I will insist upon my point of order. The gentleman is... And, but I, I'd like to make one other point, if I could, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chair, before I break, which is I believe uh, my friend from Florida just described federal law enforcement officers as Wait, cockroaches? Is, is, does he have time to speak? He's made a... a uh, and, and of course, of course I don't believe they're cockroaches. I was describing I, their propensity to be behind the wall, invisible or not. And so well, would you withdraw that offense. comment calling feds cockroaches? Would you withdraw that? Uh, my characterization wasn't intended to be derogatory. Yeah. It was intended to describe the, the, what the, a Florida the, man would realize about the propensity to see 